sessions is for the directors and members and people who are just interested in movies to um, meet and get to know each other. And as well for you to find out um, you know, what are some of the things that we do, um, ask some questions and hopefully um, express some interest in an activity you'd like to um, volunteer with. So what we're going to do is we'll, I'm um, going to have a couple of uh, slideshows on projects that we've been um, involved in. Oh, Catherine is coming. Okay, we'll let, admit her. It's okay, I can look after it while you got her? Okay, yeah. okay. So we'll, um, as I was saying, the purpose is, is that the directors and members and people who are interested can meet each other and as well um, get to know what we're doing and uh, volunteer for some activities that you're interested in. Um, we're going to have a couple of slideshows um, on a couple of activities that we've been doing and have an opportunity for discussion after. But first we should um, introduce our board members to um, Joanne. So uh, if you want to start Shelly, we'll go in order across the screen. I don't know if it's the same order in everybody. Okay, so hi Joanne, <laughs> I'm Shelly. I'm one of your neighbors, I live on Shelly Road. And um, so I think I might have met you at one of the Pioneer Crescent Neighborhood Residents Association things. I know, I've met, I know I've met Doug, so. And so pretty involved in this kind of stuff and I like to get out there and get my feet wet too. So anyway, on to Elaine. Elaine Lafay, board member. I don't know what else uh, I can say. I work on the board. I mean, I do work for the board. I do editing for the newsletter and the other articles. And uh, I do water sampling with Barb during the summer months and in the fall for the regional district of Nanaimo. And um, other things as well, which I cannot think of right at this moment. So let's continue on. Carl. I'm Carl. <laughs> <laughs> That's not enough. <laughs> I've been on the board probably as long as anybody, uh, but uh, I just do what's required. <laughs> okay, Dick? Uh, Dick Dobler, yeah, more of a worker bee, but uh, yeah, I haven't been doing too much this week. A little beaver activity, that's about it. Chris? Yeah, uh, I'm on the board. Um, periodically go out and get my feet wet with Peter right now, doing a little bit of flow monitoring up in Shelley Creek. Dick, I just noticed that the beaver took out a couple of big alders up by the... Uh, off the other side of the hatchery by the intake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did. They've been working on the bigger trees lately for some reason. <laughs> He's a big beaver. <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few. So yeah, and 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 I'm just fresh. I'm freshly on the board. I'm I'm I'm, I'm your friendly neighborhood keener. <laughs> and you. next, the order is different on everybody's screen, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let Shelley go or lead on. Barb? So I'm Peter and I've been around for 10 years and uh, have an interest in a number of, of flow monitor or monitoring projects on the river and keen about uh, restoring habitats for salmon and trout. So we got uh, lots happening coming up in the coming year, that's for sure. You'll find out about it. Great, thank you. That's everybody. So, if everyone has the beverage of their choice, <laughs> um, we're going to, um, Pete Law is going, to, oh, first of all, cheers. <laughs> I should have stirred that. Um, anyways, we're going to start. <laughs> Barb, maybe we should have our guests introduce themselves. Since we don't have very many, then we can hear a little bit about them too. That's right. Good idea. Hello, Joanne. Hi. Um, we live just off Pioneer near Shelley 
Creek. Um, Doug and I have been pretty involved with the Nature Trust, mainly Doug and the Neighborhood Association, watching the Englishman and Shelly Creek for many years. I'm interested in salmon restoration habitat, definitely. I'm a fly fisher girl. Wow. Yeah, big time. <laughs> anyway. Love, love to look at what's going on in the river. We've seen a lot of degradation over the years, stuff going on, but we're seeing more fish in the river, we think, but I'd like to find out more about it. Anyway. You're the gal for us. <laughs> That's why I signed up. <laughs> okay, Ross? Oh, me? Yeah, you. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm just... Uh a member and willing to do it, uh, whatever comes up, whatever anybody needs a hand, I'll do what I can. Great. And James, who's digging in this cupboard. <laughs> He's looking for his booze. <laughs> I'm, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a long time interested fisheries guy, re recently retired in uh, 2018. Um, I first uh, swam the Englishman River uh, looking for steelhead in the wintertime on my own for fun when I moved to the island in uh, 93. And uh, I'd call up the then steelhead biologist, Craig Whiteman, and give him my numbers that I would count in the river. And I guess it made an impression on him. He gave me a job in 1998 that turned into a 20 year career. Wow. So I uh, worked for BC Conservation Foundation and I've swum the Englishman River countless times in all seasons, done a lot of work on it. I have a real passion for the river and its fish. And I live right next to it in uh, San Pariel. So I'm lucky there. And uh, I was uh, probably involved in some of the first allocations of money back in the uh, Pacific Salmon Endowment Fund days in the early 2000s where MVIHES and, and Faye Smith did her thing and, and uh, there's a lot of great history back there too. So glad to be here and uh, glad to be associated with all of you guys who are so like-minded. It's great to have you, James. Yeah, and Catherine. Hi, Barb, can you top up my uh, Bailey? <laughs> oh, no, this is rum, sorry. Oh, rum, no, <laughs> never, never mind. <laughs> um, I just live down the street from Barb, so she can quickly in the break run over and uh, bring her Bailey with her. Um, I live by French Creek and uh, Morningstar Creek and have been involved for a few years um, with this group. Um, originally, I was helping out with um, Nile Creek uh, Hatchery when I lived in Bowser, and that's how I got bitten by the salmon bug um, from Alberta 15 years ago, worked with the provincial government there, and so happy to be out here and with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that's great. Okay, so I think what we'll do is we'll um, start with Pete. He's going to show us a slideshow of uh, some drone footage and our eel, the local eelgrass beds. So take it away, Pete. I'm gonna take this off. So there, there is one thing I want to do before uh, I, I do that, and that is uh, tell every, show everybody something that uh, was seen in the estuary yesterday. Wow. A porcupine. I, oh my goodness. <laughs> what is he on? Oh, I see it. Can you see the porcupine? I can. What is he on? He's on a kind of a dirt tuft in the, uh, in the, in the middle of the estuary. Oh. And... <laughs> you photoshopping again, Peter. Somebody <laughs> sent me this this morning. And uh, he's on the call here. He obviously was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> I'll give you porcupines on Vancouver Island. I'll give you one hint. You 
you can all go there right now. And as long as the tide's the same, you can get the exact same <laughs> shot. <laughs> show set pick again. Show set photo. Isn't it amazing? I mean, if you show this to 99 or 100 people, you'll get 99 people believing it's a porcupine. It's amazing. <laughs> Uh, hold on a second. I've got uh, the ability to share screens and I've got it up on half of my laptop. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I, I've never done this share screen thing, but I'll try it. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> no, sorry. I don't know how to do it. Okay. <laughs> You got it good, Pete. Okay, I'm sharing the screen. All right. So, uh, there's a couple of things. I uh, Can you see this? Yes. So, back last summer, uh, I uh, was approached by one of uh, our members who said, I have a drone. And I thought to myself, oh, how could we use that drone and possibly right away? And it was kind of early summer, uh, beginning of some low, low tides. And I thought one thing would be really useful would be to uh, have the uh, guy fly the low tides and looking for eelgrass. So the question was, why is eelgrass an important link to the survival of salmon and trout in the Englishman River? And you folks probably don't know this, but uh, there was a um, so here's here's the drone just for your information. There has been a survey of eelgrass out in front of the Englishman estuary. It was done about 12 years ago oh. and done. by Faye and um, a number of people. And I looked back into the, uh, some of the mapping and here's an example of Oops, you can see these light green blips all the way along the coast. These are areas where there's map, there's, there's eelgrass beds. You can see this is Parksville Bay where my cursor is. And I'm not too sure if you can see this, but uh, here I'm gonna minimize this. This is Craig Bay and you can see this is information that was collected uh, actually in the late 70s, early 80s. And Do you have any way of zooming in on that? No, I just put it into a PowerPoint. Okay. I, you know, all I wanted to show you was there's been some inventory of, of uh, eelgrass in our area. Craig Bay, San Perel Beaches, and Parksville Bay. Okay. Now, Mibbies in 2007 actually had a project and they did uh, a very large area of assessment. And you can see it's basically everything from Little Qualicum Estuary all the way down to Craig Bay. Uh, I, I, I don't necessarily see, um, they, they, they basically outlined in green, again, eelgrass beds or the presence of eelgrass. The, uh, this information was collected using a, a method of uh, low tide assessment with uh, somebody out uh, in a dry suit swimming along looking in the water and trying to identify where eelgrass was. In 
2016, uh, Mabry, uh, the folks up at VIU did an assessment in the estuary itself, a diving assessment, and they just identified a couple of small spots where they found eelgrass right in the uh, uh, discharge area of the river and just over by Surfside. Now I don't know what the extent of their of their uh, assessment was but it was pretty small only identified within the estuary and maybe a couple of hundred meters either side. So I wanted to uh, just let you guys see uh, some information about uh, what eelgrass is all about and the, how important it is. So I thought I'd show you a small video. Here we go. Hey, Pete. Yeah. Did you put all this together? No. So Joanne said that she has a wetsuit. So if you need somebody to help you go along there, James, then <laughs> maybe you could call Joanna. Hey Pete, based on uh, the, I think three years, three different years or of observation there, do you, can you say whether it's trending up or trending down? Hold on. Okay. It looks like there's a lot of opportunities for people to do things there other than just actually get in the water and, and uh, or fly over it and look at the eelgrass based on that video. Right. So I wanted to uh, now really just uh, show you, just for your information, we are actually 
uh, identified as being members of that seagrass, <laughs> seagrass conservation group. Uh, I didn't know that. And, and really what we're, what I wanted to just say today was, um, uh, you know, really it's been about 10, well, 12 years since uh, there's been really any communication with the seagrass conservation group and any assessment of eelgrass. Uh, so we have now some unbelievable drone footage of the entire beach from Craig Bay all the way around to Parksville Bay. And uh, in, in quickly answering James Craig's question about what, uh, what, what, do we, what do I think we're seeing in terms of, of sea grasses in our area, uh, I think that we're seeing a lot more just judging from what is available in terms of historic mapping, and then taking a look at these photos. Can you see uh, where Carl lives over here at uh, Craig Bay? That's Craig Bay Estates straight ahead in this picture. And that gives you an idea of uh, the seagrasses in Craig Bay that, uh, that are now dominant. Can you see this? Yep. Is that all eelgrass or what is it? No, it, it can be different sea grasses. It's not okay. all eelgrass. Uh, that's what needs to be done with going down on the ground and, and actually doing surveys. Here's Rath Trevor looking towards Craig Bay. Rath Trevor looking towards Sam Perel. And you can see, uh, you can see lots of grasses now in the, on the beaches. Here's, uh, I guess the drone is over Sam Perel, actually over the estuary looking down towards Rath Trevor. And you can see the patches of, of eelgrass that are immediately at the low end of the low, low tide. Parksville Bay. So um, that's just a, a, a quick example of some of the pictures that we get from uh, from the drone, and I just wanted to share those with you. Um, I'm in communication right now with uh, Project Watershed, and. <laughs> That's it. That's your desktop picture? Yeah. That's my desktop picture. Bella and, uh, Bella and um, Brady, no. Brody. Brody. How do I get you all up? Go, go to the... Um... There you are. Yeah. It's okay, I stopped your sharing for you. Thank you. The power. So all I wanted to just say was uh, we now have probably in the neighborhood of 200 images. I have just shown you some of the, the uh, easier to see where we are images. But we have images now, it, uh, you know, by and looking at the mapping that had been done in 2008, 2009, and the mapping from DFO in 
1979, 1978, I would say we're, we have a lot more seagrasses on more seagrass mapping uh, and seeing if we, uh, we might have a, a summertime program starting um, hopefully in the coming year or two. So Pete, are you going to like to contact the seagrass conservation group that we are apparently are a member of and Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean all of that uh is 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 something that has to be done and uh uh we'll we'll, we'll make communicate try to set some communication up with them and uh see whether these these first of all whether these photographs these drone photographs actually can be can be used for uh some level of of mapping if at all possible and uh, then actually doing some ground truthing in the coming year how how can we do that what methods are used uh that video showed uh divers uh, I know Project Watershed up in the Comox Valley have used a, uh, an underwater ROV. And that is something that they purchased two or three years ago with a, uh, an assessment that they did from the oyster. Eelgrass. So uh, eelgrass. So I'm wondering um, what's the relationship between what we want to do and what they want to do? You've heard about that, right? To Craig Bay? I, I don't necessarily see that as being an industrial area for, for uh, um, capturing, you know, grasses. Okay. Ross? Can't hear you, Ross. Okay. A small group of us uh, wrote a report about five years ago on the seaweed har commercial seaweed harvest in the Bowser area. This was for uh, uh, the chemical chemicals to be extracted for anyway uh strange as it may seem the permitting for this sort of thing is, is being done by the province not by the federal government the federal government of course has the responsibility to manage marine resources but for some reason uh, permitting and licensing for commercial harvest Seaweed is, is provincial, and uh, we found the province had very little experience or knowledge uh, of whether there was even a harvestable surplus in the area. It seems to me any any resource manager has to figure that out first before you can uh, dish out permits and licenses. Anyway, uh, we challenged them on that. And I, I think it was mainly because the uh, market dried up that the harvesting disappeared. But we had, uh, we had some interesting research on this, on the, uh, uh, the effects of harvesting on the local biota. And it's not inconsequential. There are a lot of things we simply don't understand yet. And I think it would be foolhardy for any government to be giving permits for the extraction of any kind of seaweed from our coast. So, uh, but yeah, I also wanted to mention that DFO commissioned a consultant study on fish and invertebrate use of eelgrass uh, further up the coast. And uh, 
still waiting for the consultant's report to be issued, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of on this with somebody up there who knows what the study's all about. And uh, I think it will be interesting for MIBIs to, to learn to, just how important seaweed is to fish, invertebrates, to brant geese and other parts of our ecosystem. So it's, anyway, as soon as I find out, you'll find out. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, we should probably uh, move on if there aren't any more questions. Can I just um, add something? Um, I was involved with uh, seagrass transplanting group up in uh, Deep Bay, and that was about 12 years ago. And uh, there was a group from Nile Creek there, Green Keepers, and uh, I'm trying to remember the rest, and that's a long time ago. But um, yeah, I think they were transplanting the japonica. It's um, more conducive to holding eggs, carrying eggs. And uh, so they, they've done a bit of research on that. And, and I, it stopped all of a sudden. I don't know why. Maybe the players changed or something. But yeah, it was fascinating doing it. We went out several times. Wow, yeah. that's interesting. That's probably something we need to um, keep in mind when we go forward with this. So. Okay, well, thank you. Um, James? You're muted. Just a quick question, Peter. Uh, do you know if the three studies that have occurred already, do you know if those methods are repeatable and are you doing it uh, in one of those ways for MVI's ongoing data set or you know, I'm just interested in having apples and apples at the end of the day to, so that we can actually see whether we've, uh, whether we're gaining or losing. Right. So there was a method. Here's the report that um, we did in 2008. And yes, there's a, a methodology associated with how they did this work uh, to the next level and do it, you know, perhaps next summer in 2021. But uh, I, I, I would like to ensure that, uh, you know, if there's, if there's been updates to the methods, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the folks at uh, up in Project Watershed, at least they're close by Project Watershed folks. And I know that they've, they've had a, like a half a million dollar project to do this kind of mapping. Whether there's some expertise there that we can uh, dovetail into, that's, that was what I was trying to do. Yes, we wanna compare apples to apples. Okay, that's good, all right. All right, thank you. Um, I guess we'll move on to uh, my slideshow, which is on Martindale Pond, the project that we completed this um, fall, late summer and fall. Now I'm gonna see if I remember how to share a screen. <laughs> okay. It was only an hour ago, Barb. You should have been able to remember. <laughs> going to let me see. I'm going to have to get out and put it in the slideshow from the... Uh, we can see your PowerPoint. You just have to click on slideshow on the PowerPoint thing at the bottom there, don't you? Yeah, I got to call it up here. There, you see it? Yes. Okay. And I will use, I don't need to do that. You can see my uh, cursor? Yep. Okay. 
So this is, um, of course, drone footage of uh, Martindale Pond, I believe it was in 2018. And uh, the, it's pretty hard to actually see the pond. Um, it's, you know, it's, um, I'm going to get rid of this. There we go. No, so the pond is right about in this area and Shelly Creek comes in from, from around in here and travels this way and then comes through um, the culvert here. No. And then farther down. Yeah, right there. A little to the right. To the right. Oh, shoot. <laughs> oh, good with technology. Oh, God. Right. Oh, here. Yes, there. Yeah. Okay. So, Shelby Creek has um, been filling up with sediment, as we know, and, and this is, you know, most of this that we see, this orangey, is, is uh, the it's pond wheat that's really taken over. As well, there's all sorts of reed canary grass, which is um, an invasive species in all of this area here. Um, we were also, you know, getting yellow iris in here, and there was a removal program for that. So, so the, as everyone, most people know that uh, Martindale Pond is really important because our um, co-host Sam and Fry over winter here. They come from the Englishman River to um, escape the turbulent flows and they develop into smolts in the spring and then they migrate out through the culvert um, downstream to the Englishman River and then out to um, the ocean. As well we get cutthroat trout and rainbow trout in here so it's a very important area. We've had up to 8,000 coho salmon smolts um, residing in this pond. So it's, it, it, it is quite productive, but lately we've been getting, you know, uh, maybe 1,000 to 3,000 smolt in here. So it's, you know, whether that's a reflection of the salmon population or, or the habitat, it's still, it's the, the actual available habitat was getting less and less each year with all this vegetation and sediment. So we applied for a PSF grant, which was um, approved to dig this pond out. Now this is just to give you the location of this, if you're not sure, this is Martindale Road right here. So the creek's coming through this way across the road. The other side of the road, the creek looks completely different. This is where we install our uh, smolt fence every year and our smolt counting box. Um, so you can see that, you know, that the, the creek here looks like an actual creek. Here's drone footage of what the um, pond looks like now. Oh, quite a difference there. There's you know, all this reed canary grass that was growing in here. You can see it's been cut way back. It's much more open, much more open. And actually there's this here was supposed to be a sediment collection pond because we get flooding from the Englishman River that comes this way and into the pond. So the idea of this sediment uh, collection pond was to, to trap that sediment that was in the water, that was in the floodwaters. But what happened was when it was dug out after <laughs> the pond was cut, um, we hit, they hit um, some groundwater. So that's why it's actually have, has water in it. And if you go out there and look, you'll see the water actually looks very tinged with, with a red color. And that's the natural iron content that's in that um, groundwater, in that aquifer. So how did we do this? So we, Pacific, I'm oh, sorry, Parksville Heavy Equipment um, was contracted to clean out the pond and uh, they used a crane with a 90 foot boom. And that's unusual to have a 90 foot boom, that's quite large. And you can see that there's a clam bucket, um, a clamshell bucket on the end of a chain here. So what that would do is it would swing over 
and grab a bunch of sediment or um, reed canary grass and swing over. Um, there was a sump. You can see some of the sump right here that was constructed. The sediment was dumped beside the sump so that the water could run out of it and back into the creek. Before all of this was, um, before it started actually, Dave Clough, our biologist, and Dick Dobler, who you've met, um, installed some erosion control and sediment control um, measures. So there was uh, geotextile cloth and uh, straw, straw bales installed in the culvert. And as well, they pumped down the, um, the ponds to try to avoid any um, flow through the culvert downstream. Um, if there was flow, then the geotextile cloth and the straw bales would intercept that and keep the water nice and clear down below. Um, they also did some electrofishing to remove any uh, fish that were in the pond uh, and move them downstream. And I think they got um, about 30 coho fry from that, if I'm correct. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong. So once the, everybody's once the, muted, so if, if you want to um, uh, chime in on anything, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Barb. Yeah, okay. So the, the sediment with the water drained out of it um, was put into the dump, into dump trucks, and that was hauled to Shelley Farm, which was just around the corner from here. So that was a really good, uh, you know, it would have cost a, a lot more money if we had to haul this to a, to a um, soil disposal site or, you know, somewhere else. So it was very convenient that we could apply this, dump this right on the Shelley farm in their fields, and they would use that like, like a fertilizer because this material has a lot of nutrients in it. So after that, it was seeded with a fast growing erosion control um, seed mix. Um, and then uh, straw was applied on top of the seed, blowing away. Um, it also would keep the seed from being washed into the pond and being wasted um, when it rained. And it also stopped the soil from being um, washed into the pond until the, you know, the seed could uh, could germinate. And following that, we installed some red osier dogwood stakes. Um, red osier dogwood, you can see some in the tight top right hand corner, just kind of beyond that, that brush there. There's a really thick growth of red osier dogwood, which is a great species for um, repairing environments. It's uh, really hold like a strengthens the banks, prevents erosion, and also provides lots of um, shade. So what we did was we cut down some saplings and cut lengths of these stakes, of these stems, and then you pound them into the ground. You want to try to have two thirds of the stem into the ground. And what's under, uh, what's under the ground will actually develop roots. So it will grow roots right out of that stake and then eventually we'll get um, buds growing out. So this was done all around the, um, the area that had been um, disturbed with the machinery and around that um, sediment control pond. And this was taken, I'm sorry about the glare, but this was taken a month after the seed was um, spread. Look at the grass. The grass is coming up really, really well. Like that was a fast growing <laughs> species. <laughs> it's really well established. Um, so what we did was, you know, we were concerned that the swale, the swale here, this is where the floodwaters from the Englishman River would come or even runoff from the road would come in low, newly dug, and it was kind of loose material. And so was this here. This was all still kind of loose. Whereas over here, everything was very compacted because uh, of all the um, equipment that had been running over it. 
So we were concerned that with this, this loose material was a little easier to erode away than this um, compacted material. So we put some coconut husk based erosion blankets that we bought off of um, Parksville Heavy Equipment and just laid it down um, to provide some extra stability there. And the, um, the grass will actually grow right through this uh, erosion blanket. You can see that it's got kind of a, a wide, an open weave. And by the time we left, there was already grass poking out through it. So this, this will um, help stabilize the, um, these areas of concern a bit more. Okay, and there is Carl looking out over the finished project. Um, Carl has been working on this project for three years, trying to get this going. So, and now it's done. So congratulations, Carl, well done. And Dave Clef, this is Dave Clef, the biologist who, who designed the, um, the project and took care of permitting and looked after the erosion control and moving fish. Oops. The next step is um, to work on the creek upstream of Martin Pond, Martin, yeah, Martindale Pond, which is um, on the Shelley Farm. What you're seeing here is the creek, section of creek upstream that has also been filled right up with sediment. You can see there's no distinctive um, creek channel left. There's no pools or riffles that uh, fry need to, to um, survive. Even though we've seen fry in here, they, they seem to have been surviving, but still is not very good or productive habitat for them. Um, it's lined both sides by Himalayan um, blackberry, which you know is an invasive species. And because of its shallow roots, it offers no riparian value at all. It, uh, it does not stabilize uh, banks or anything like that. So, so we applied uh, this fall for another grant to do this work on the Shelley farm to dig out, excavate the um, blackberry, um, dig out a dig out the sediment and produce a <laughs> stream channel and put in riffles and pools that uh, you know to to improve the uh, fish habitat for that. So that's what we're um, going to be working on. Hopefully next year if we get uh, a grant for it. Oops, and that's it. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah, Barb, I don't know if you got an email. A friend of mine saw six coho up there spawning last week. Yes, actually, yes, I did get, yeah. just get that email. Yeah, that's yeah. really cool. That was interesting. Yeah, so that was right, that was right up on the farm, right? Yeah, yeah, right below the, you know, where the culvert drops in there. Right. And that is not ideal spawning habitat at all. That's just mm -hmm. all. Well, there must be some gravel in there. Kind of oh, blower road project. <laughs> yeah, it's, but I mean, it's still not great spawning habitat. No. No. You want to have cobbles and but they get a few every year. Right. The interesting thing about that creek was not too many years ago, they could take a canoe from the farm. Now, Mark, um, what kind of monitoring yep. do you have in mind to show the success of the excavation project? Kind of what? Monitoring. Oh. Well, uh, that's just doing our um, continuing with the, the smoke counting and see what the, if there's a difference, if there's a significant difference from before and after doing this. And how will you separate that number from population dynamics in the river? What do you mean? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's a really good question too. Like we would have to look at that and see if the, if um, one year, 
to make sure that we're not seeing a reduction or an increase because there were either less or more spawners in the river. Did they? And that, that, that is something we did look at. Like in one of the, I remember one of the um, small counts uh, reports that like we do those annually and we look, we compare with past years, but we look at a number of, of conditions um, when we're looking at these, the, uh, the smoke counts and what could be causing an increase or a decrease. So we're looking at the weather, um, you know, the amount of rain that we get in a year, um, the temperatures as well. Um, maybe there was a high mortality of, of fry because we had a really hot um, early spring. Um, we've known that fry have been, and smolts have been trapped behind a couple of beaver dams that are out there. So, and, and we have looked at the, um, <clears throat> what the escapement was like for the spawners too, for these years. So we try to tie that all together as well. We, so. we can also look at the presence or absence of trout because some years we've had more they, trout they and more recently they... there's been fewer, um, pure trout because as the pond's been filling up, there hasn't been as much habitat for the trout. So once we see uh -huh. the numbers of trout that are coming through to... as well, it'll help be another indicator. Plus this year, there, was, there wasn't just a decrease, or yeah, there wasn't just a decrease in trout and uh, coho. There was a decrease in all species. So there was a decrease in sculpins and stick backs as well. That was really interesting. We've never seen that before. We, it's usually we get you know tons of stickleback and and about a you know about half of the stickleback is in that number will be sculpin. And this year there were hardly any in in comparison. So that's that was interesting too. Mm. I don't know what it would have caused that other than you know lack of habitat or Question, Barb. Yep. Does uh, does the group know uh, what proportion of the smolt output of Shelley Creek is due to fish coming in from the main stem and overwintering in Shelley Creek versus uh, born and raised in Shelley Creek? No, we do not know that. That would be interesting because it had been kind of poo pooed for a long time that. Um, salmon were actually spawning in Shelley Creek. I, I think from, from, you know, a DFO perspective or whatever. So <laughs> I think they have to believe it's now, but yeah, I, I don't think there was a lot of acceptance before that uh, the salmon were spawning. They hmm. thought maybe it was a one-off or whatever, but it sounds like it's something that's, uh, hmm. that does happen. Hmm. Is there a plan to try to assess that? Thought about that, but that is something that, you know, we should consider. I, th yeah. I, think, I think, Barb, if, if, if you found salmon fry in the pond just before the excavation in the summer, that's a pretty good indication that they came from the mm -hmm. creek and not from the river. I was really, and I was really surprised to hear that. And I think Dave Clough was surprised. Well, I mean, coho are rather innovative. They swim up a wet ro rope if they have to to get to some place. So uh, it wouldn't, to me, it wouldn't be surprising to know that there's perhaps always some spawning above the culvert. Mm -hmm. I guess it's like if you don't look right. for them, you don't know they're there. Yeah, yeah, but that's something that could be. You know, we need volunteers to do that. James. <laughs> well, then we already have, the any a, the... we have a salmon escapement program that we can that we can start working on. There are some protocols out there that we can follow to actually, you know, do some escapement counts on Shelly Creek. Yeah, I, I think that would be really important to do. And, and I'm wondering if because there's only a few really that would that go up there whether the timing is really important, like you could miss them. You could go, you know, within days it would be over, is what I'm wondering. So we'd have to have somebody maybe monitoring that daily for a while. Hmm. I wonder if uh, 
an evaluation of the juveniles uh, would be uh, more appropriate rather than the adult spawning? Well, I think it would be good to have documentation, actual documentation that the, the adults are spawning there um, so that we can get funding for um, spawning habitat improvements or, you know, up there. But yeah, um, we probably have to assess juveniles as well. Um, there is that pit tagging pro program that's going to be starting that at least would be helping to find out, you know, um, how many of the smolts come back up into Martindale Pond when they go to, you know, to spawn, if they do. Has MVI ever done a G-trapping program in the, in the summer in Shelley Creek throughout its length? Pete, maybe you can answer that. You've been... Um, um, we got to understand, we're only talking about, about 450 meters of water that salmon can access. And the spawning habitat is really the, the top uh, 100 meters, maybe 150 meters, and then it goes right into, you know, a wetland soup mud kind of composite. Have we done minnow trapping? Yes, we've done lots of minnow trapping, usually to focus on overwinter uh, numbers. So we've put traps in starting you know around now to see whether numbers of fish coming you know between between times we do it between months are, are starting to accumulate and we're starting to see more fish showing up and uh, you know yeah it, it, it fish do start showing up during the winter months uh, it was interesting just a sidebar right after the pond was built just in late, mid-September, late September. I think Carl and uh, Dick put some uh, minnow traps into the, uh, the pond and, and filled a couple of minnow traps up with coho. So they came in early. Um, we were a bit surprised there was some coho in when we started building the pond and yeah. we thought the oxygen level would be such that they wouldn't the oxygen level would be such that they wouldn't couldn't survive but the oxygen level wasn't that bad because there were spots where there was uh, aquifers coming up so pete you said that they had already start coming in as in already swimming up shelly creek in 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 preparation for overwintering in it, or that's my, assent, my 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 uh, assumption, James, is that uh, we were. I mean, the project had finished maybe two weeks, three weeks before, and as the water had uh, had had cleared up because of the um, the spring that had been. Uh, pushed or, or, or cleaned up during the construction. The, the pond cleaned up in terms of turbidity and very quickly thereafter, there were, I think it was 20 or 30 fish per minnow trap. And you're, and you're confident that those numbers couldn't have been already- In the site? In, uh, in Shelly Creek. In How the about the farm? Just upstream. I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to believe that they would, you know, if you just go through the, the, the bio standards of, of, you know, there really is not that much spawning habitat in that, in that upper 100 meters, 150 meters of, of, of Shelly Creek. You can't put, you know, lots of uh, pre-smolts into, uh, you know, into the, into the system uh, just just based on the amount of habitat that's available now. Some of those fish have got to be coming from the main stem, if not the majority. That's all that's kind of been my belief 
you know, and I, I, I must admit, I'm, uh, I, I only think it's maybe 10% actually come from Shelly Creek itself. Maybe the even less. Or less. Yeah. So that's the pit tagging project, which we haven't talked about today, but that's something that's coming up in the next two years. That'll, you know, really help to understand uh, where Shelly Creek actually sits in terms of uh, how, in terms of coal production generally in, uh, in the Englishman watershed. They want BCCF, who are the primary contractors, would like to, to pit tag, which is a little tag that goes into a fish and can be read at a, at a underwater antennae. Um, they want to tag 1500 from Shelley Creek. They want to tag 1500 from the Clay Young Channel. They want to tag 1500 from Center Creek. So it gives you a sense of distribution. They're going to distribute where they want to get tags from. And of course, they want to tag as many trout smolts as possible. Okay. Great. Is there anything anyone else wanted to um, ask or talk about, like with any other other um, activities that we do? Or yeah, I know Joanne is just itching to do some snorkeling for eel grass. And, <laughs> <laughs> and Chris wants to show off one of his fish. It's fish. That's right. Okay, Chris, you sh you uh, show us your stuff. You're muted right now, by the way. So. You're muted, yeah. There you go. I just, this is the, I don't know if you can see it. There we go. Um, so it's just a little cutthroat, glass cutthroat. Um, and we've been talking about, as other things we've been talking about as well as the as well as the pit tagging and the, the reconstruction, or the re reconstruction, the dredging of the of the Martindale Pond. Um, I think Peter's is excited as anybody about the possibility of putting an array in Shelly Creek and finding out where the cutthroat that are there are going. Um, I mean, as as we know, the Shelly Creek is primarily dried up in the summertime, yet at the same time, it sustains a population of cutthroat, and you don't really know where they're coming and going from. So there's a there's a water conservation project afoot that Ross is is sort of spearheading, uh, and the thought was that we're going to target the the uh, Corfield Estates subdivision, which is around. Shelly Creek um, in this in this water conservation um, movement, and and part of it would be asking people to bring in to, to show us two copies of their water bill, in the first year and the second year, and see, seeing if their water bill is is um, is less, see what they've actually done in conservation, and put them <laughs> in a in a lottery, to put them in a draw, and basically give the give the winners of this fish. Perhaps this fish. Actually, I think this fish has got a buyer already. So there's a gallery up, up island that's been talking, talking to me about this. Um, but there are two other molds. I'm working on one, another one right now that's going to be an improvement, Peter. <laughs> I like that. Hey, Chris, can you hold up the fish again? A little closer. I just want to make sure you got spots on all the fins. Yeah. <laughs> Good Very man. cool. Good man. <laughs> There's always one. <laughs> so what, what we do for a living, you know. <laughs> hey, listen, a, a good friend of mine, um, retired biologist. Uh, took Chris to, uh, to task for not putting the spots on the Chinook salmon in the right shape. Do you remember that, Chris? 
Yeah. <laughs> They're re ready to criticize. Uh, th th there's th th no room for artistic license at all. <laughs> I know. I mean, it's, it's really amazing because my primary concern. I mean, the whole sort of thing behind these, the salmon and the and the and the trout, and the steelhead, is to basically have have glass becoming fish. So the 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 real drive for me, being a glass artist, is that they are glassy. I've made coho that are just absolutely bang on, but they don't look like they're glass. So I've actually had to remake them in a way where they're they're, they're the colors are lighter and, and it is more apparent that they're actually made of glass. Um, the next. The next uh, um, cutthroat is going to have a lot more dots on it, and I spent a lot of time paying attention to the, uh, <laughs> the shape of the dots. They're really almost almost pixelated in a way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes, Joanne. Oh, you're still muted, Joanne. You're muted, Joanne. <laughs> There. Um, just on my phone, it's, it is a resident base a bit. Over here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How's that? There you go. Yeah. So that is a resident rainbow that has lived in the upper Englishman for years, apparently. Wow. It was released. It's fly fishing friend. Yeah. So there are some older huge, big, big residence. He thought it was a steelhead. It's a, um, I gave it to a fellow, Mike McCullough, mm. and um, he said it was a resident steelhead that he had caught one in 2013. So they're quite rare. Anyway. Wow. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. He wow. lives, that gentleman I think lives in Craig Bay. Hey, Joanne, what date did that fish get caught? Oh, that was probably about a month wow. ago. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were fishing there the next day with one of the guys that was standing next to him when he got it. It was, it was um, pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah. Anyway, so. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think that just about wraps it up, unless someone else has something inspiring to say or <laughs> to add. Um, James, I'll probably be picking your brain for, you know, some surveying things that we could do in Shelley Creek to, to kind of cover off more of the uh, population of what's going on in there. That's okay. Sure. All right. Well, thanks everyone for attending and uh, have a very Merry Christmas if we don't see you before then. Although the directors will be having a meeting next Thursday. Don't forget that, please, guys. Um, and that'll probably be by Zoom because the, the Shelley, um, the, the Strata Clubhouse isn't available right now for... Yeah, no, no public gatherings are permitted right now under COVID restrictions, so we have to do it virtually. Yeah. All right. Well, I oh. Just one Hi, other thing. Everybody. I saw some people working at, we were hiking up at Englishman River Falls last week, and there was people working in a stream on the upper part of the river, not in the Englishman, but in a side channel. There was people, is that part of your group? They were clearing debris out of the creek. Might have been someone from you guys. It was kind of interesting. I didn't ask them because they were in on what is deemed private property. There's a do not trespass. So we didn't go over and ask them who they were with or what they were doing, but they were obviously clearing out an um, creek bed, an upper creek bed on the Englishman. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Kind of yeah. Hey, anyway. Joanne. Can you can you uh, mm -hmm. share with us where exactly you're, oh, you're talking okay. about? Oh, okay. So if some you know a um, map or something. Well, I can just tell you. Maybe. You know where the parking lot is at um, uh -huh. the campground there. There's a the from the um, parking lot we walk through the campground and the creek is right at the end of the um, campground. Just above. The it falls. gets quite steep, steep off there. Yeah, the the falls. Mm -hmm. Was right there near the campground. Where the, these guys weren't. Uh, 
bike enthusiasts, were they? No, no, absolutely no. not. No. They were in the creek bed, clearing out the creek bed. And clearing out the creek bed. Interesting. Hmm. Was yeah. This yeah, I just wondered what they were, you know. Anyway. Get the drone out. Get down, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, next time I'll hop the no trespassing sign and go ask them, how's that? <laughs> yeah. No, don't take any risks. Don't take any risks. You never know with people nowadays. So. <laughs> they weren't homeless. They had um, reflective vests on. They looked like they were working on creek restoration, was what it looked like to us. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, time. Check them out. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank right. you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Bye bye. Bye now. Bye. See you next week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>